All right. Hi, everyone. I am Julia McIntosh of ASQ Communications. Thank you for joining us for ASQ's first uh, Hangout on Air. So today we are having a live discussion with some of ASQ's Influential Voices bloggers. And you can also meet some of them in a recent um, article in the July Quality Progress. Um, there is a link on the event page for this Hangout. So we'll be talking about blogging and social media and the value of these things to quality professionals. Um, first, I want to introduce all of our participants. So we have Jennifer Stefanowski, and she writes Quality Time as part of Influential Voices. We have Edwin Guerrero, and he blogs on his site, PXS Global. He's from Costa Rica. We have Dan Stromiak, who writes The Quality Evolution. He is from Canada. Hello. And last but not least, we have Babette Tenhaken, who writes sales aerobics for engineers. So thank you for joining us, everyone. I'll get started with the questions. Uh, we'll jump right in. So, and we'll do the first question in the order of the introductions. Um, so the first question is, how did you get involved in blogging, and why are you doing it? So Jennifer, let's start with you. Uh, well, that's actually a really interesting response, and it goes back to 2000, uh, which was a while ago. Uh, personally, we had set up a website to kind of catalog our photos uh, and keep family abroad. We have a lot of family living uh, abroad, so we wanted to keep them updated. So it was kind of going to be a live journal type of thing to where we would share information about our lives and such. Uh, a few fast forward a few years, and I really started seeing the value in more B2B content being put out there. And I also really, in working with ProQC, saw clients ask the same questions, you know, over and over about outsourcing, quality, supply chain questions. And I thought, well, a blog might be a really good venue to be able to, you know, not only as a good marketing action, but more so to put value-added content out there uh, for people who had these questions. So that's kind of how the ProQC blog, my employer, came up. And then, of course, you had reached out for Influential Voices, and I thought, you know, wow, what a great opportunity to extend past the family stuff, past this strictly, you know, professional work stuff, and be able to really expand on ideas that I found personally interesting uh, that involve not only quality, but marketing, management, uh, and, and related things. And the Influential Voices has been a real driver um, for that one. So a few different reasons, but I guess ultimately uh, my personal, the iGen, the one we're referencing here, was a way to also consolidate my social media presence and kind of have everything in one place and be able to kind of express those ideas outside of the professional space that I was doing for ProQC. That, that would be really how I got involved in blogging. And since it's quiet, I'll go ahead and mention, too, I was one of those people that did uh, consistently journal, you know, uh, as a younger individual. So it was kind of a natural extension of that as well. What about the rest of you, just to kind of pick up on that and continue, because I see that um, Julia's screen's a little bit frozen, so if the rest of us, maybe we can continue this conversation. Edward? I think I was next in, in the order, yes. Uh, I, I became a writer in 2006 or 2007, I, I, I don't remember, and I have a saying, now we see Julia. Yeah. I apologize. Apologies, we had some technical issues, so I'm back on, and I see that Edwin was answering the question. Yeah, I was next in the order, right? I was the second in the order. Yep. Did you get a chance to answer it? Oh no, I'm I'm just starting. Okay, great. Go ahead. I, I was saying that that the way I see a writer, for me, a writer is an overflown reader. Okay, so I've been reading my whole life. So at some point, I decided 
I have too much letter inside of me. It is time to write. Okay, so I started writing articles for a weekly financial newspaper in Costa Rica. Okay, that was from 2007 to 2011, maybe, and, and back. I'm back writing for them. And um, I'm starting blogging at the beginning of 2013, I, I think. 2013 and uh, uh, the reason I do it is is because I have a I have an audience in Spanish mainly okay which covers 25 countries something something like that okay and I, I, I really enjoy in a way talking to them through my blog okay basically that's basically it all right great. Thank you. So let's um, ask this question uh, of Dan. So Dan, why do you blog? How did you get started? And why do you keep doing it? Thank you, Julia. Um, actually, I first had a blog about five or six years ago, but the theme was more on financial planning and financial um, ideas. And I did that for a couple of months, and I lost interest in it. And my interest was um, revitalized when I attended the conference in Anaheim and I became familiar with the Influential Voices program and I think that that proved to be something that aligned with my interests and availability. Okay, great. And Babette, how about you? Uh, Sales Aerobics for Engineers blog was born on April 18th, 2009. Um, been some ideas percolating around. Uh, I saw far too much us versus them mindset, sales versus engineers, R&D versus ops. You, you know what I'm saying, quality versus everybody. And um, I had, uh, between my own business consulting as well as working with uh, young startups at the uh, University of Michigan Center for Entrepreneurship, I was just seeing that mindset perpetuated. And I said, my goodness, after this little financial debacle that we had in 2008, the meltdown, this, this stuff's got to stop. And so uh, what I did was I created 12 months worth of content a game plan and uh, ran a couple uh, draft posts by uh, some of my colleagues from the sell selling community and they just said take the trail training wheels off and uh, uh, and and get going and to me it's a way of having a conversation with people it's the conversation they didn't know that they wanted to have with you until they read your post and so it's a terrific form of communication getting things outside of the back of people's heads and just forward because they were thinking about that but perhaps they were a little bit timid so we're in a sense their voices so I like getting those conversations started all right great so my next question is, all of you use social media, um, other than just blogging, you may use Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or other networks. So I want to ask you, what, which networks do you use and, and why? What do you get out of them? So Jennifer, let's start with you. You know, I really I dedicate my social media efforts primarily to you know the basics, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and Google+. Um, I stick with those, you know, just just primarily due to the time. You know, I want to be able to really put some quality content out there. And I found when I started to expand to more social media outlets, uh, the quality of what I was able to do in each one kind of decreased. So I scaled back a little. I have two professional perspectives, of course, uh, one through ProQC. Uh, as the communications director there, one of my responsibilities is to manage our social media campaign. Um, from that degree. So, for example, uh, and then also, of course, my personal professional. So, if you look at the two different courses of action there, for example, Facebook. Uh, personally, I use that to connect with family and friends. It's also, you know, a way to manage your, your online brand. As someone who loves marketing, I have to put that out there. Um, for a pro, you see it's really interesting because we're able to use Facebook to connect our team. We have services in over 30 countries, and we really felt disconnected. And Facebook, by posting pictures of celebrations in offices, um, upcoming holidays, 
I found that our team really gets connected um, from that sense from Facebook. LinkedIn is my favorite because I call it the professional Facebook. Um, it's a place where you can quote Steve Jobs and people will like it. And uh, so I, I like connecting that way. It's also, of course, a great passive networking tool. Um, participating in the groups allows me to not only learn new things about quality and other things I'm interested in, uh, but to expand my network both locally and, and abroad. Um, from a ProQC perspective, same thing. I manage our page there, and I find it's a great way to keep in touch, um, to keep others in touch, uh, and to also connect with as a sales tool. And then finally, really, Twitter. Uh, I love Twitter because it's a great source of content ideas for me. Um, I follow a lot of various news sources and other people in the industry, and they'll post opinions or something on a topic that I hadn't thought about and I thought, oh, well, that would make a great idea for a blog post or whatnot. Um, but it's also, for both personal professional and professional professional, um, a great venue for cross-promotion. So whenever I write a blog post or, or, or something like that, I find Twitter's a really good way to get it out there and be able to communicate with that network that I've established that may not necessarily be connected with Facebook, which is much more of a, a personal platform for me. So Google+, Plus, and I, I don't mean to leave that out, especially since we're on our Google+, Plus Hangout, um, I have increasingly used that more. I find I use it more so for uh, SEO purposes, you know, um, because, of course, they put a great deal of emphasis on your post there. Uh, but I have seen more more participation in that platform, so I do plan on using that more ongoing as well. Okay, great, great ideas. So, and Edwin, how about you? Which other um, social media platforms do you use, and how are they valuable? I use basically the same, mainly Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, I I feel I'm still learning how to how to get the most out of out of social media. And uh, uh, recently, about three weeks ago, I, I hired a new person in my office just to take care of this. Okay, we we see it as, as a tool. We've been uh, successful using it, but I I I know there's more. There's more that, that we can use and that we can share and that we can get out of it. But basically, I'm a, I'm, I'm still a student of of social media. Okay, great. And uh, Dan, how about you? Yeah, it's uh, consistent with uh, what was previously mentioned. LinkedIn primarily for the professional interactions. And one thing that has been communicated to me from within my company is that what I post is read even if people don't explicitly um, respond or comment, they still will read it. And, and I have that from a very senior person that I've worked with for a number of years. So I really try to keep LinkedIn, my profile, very something that um, um, would want would want to be shown to the world. Uh, things like Facebook and Twitter and more so of uh, Observer and um, you know I, I like to see the content that comes in but it is it is more of a relaxed um, more of a relaxed uh, level of communication. I, I don't have so much experience on Google Plus or some of the other ones like uh, you know but I know they're out there and I'm sure um, over the next five years, it'll be, you know, those will flourish and dominate. So we always have to uh, keep abreast of what's, um, you know, what, what the cool kids are doing. All right, great. And um, Babette, uh, how about you? Um, I started out on LinkedIn, and, and uh, LinkedIn still is the kind of uh, home base for my social media strategy. Uh, Interestingly, I added a blogging platform recently, and so I'm doing um, some testing, comparing my audience from uh, that I get from my LinkedIn posts to my regular blog posts. Uh, I also am a heavy user of Twitter. Uh, I'm part of a consortia of about 52 bloggers in two different communities, uh, and we blog about uh, sales issues and say uh, my own personal hashtags are small to mid-sized enterprises, startups, manufacturing, and sales. And so there's a a lot of social amplification opportunities that way as well. Um, uh, Facebook uh, is just purely social for me uh, in, in terms of the issues that I'm dealing with, help, helping manufacturers make some pretty hard calls. Uh, 
that's you know Facebook's I found is not my target market but I, I'm uh, very specifically and I use other things like Hootsuite and Twiriad and uh, Nimble to really help me fine-tune my messaging and the times that I'm delivering my messages but primarily it started with LinkedIn and gosh darn it it's you know they keep upgrading it and and it's kind of fun and their blogging platform is getting to be a lot of fun as well okay Great. And I noticed we um, got a question from one of our viewers, which I would like to answer. Um, by the way, our viewers are uh, invited to uh, submit questions for the participants, and we'll get to them as best we can. But the question that was just submitted is, how much time a day or week do the panelists dedicate to blogging? So if we could go through this and answer it quickly. So Jennifer, how much time do you dedicate to blog blogging? And I have to tell you, this is the number one question I get. I do, um, I do webinars and workshops for the Institute for Corporate and Continuing Education here local. Um, and this is the number one question. How much time will it take me to develop an online presence, to manage my brand, or to do something for strategy for my small business? And my answer is always the same. Uh, I think part of, the, part of it is planning in advance and determining how much time you have because social media can take as little or as much really as you can give. Um, it's, it is part, it's a primary part of my position at ProQC, so I think that the amount of time I spend is skewed um, from maybe someone just doing it personally. But I, I spend several hours per day, um, you know, going through Twitter feeds, updating LinkedIn, responding to things in the groups, um, I, I try to, because we're in different time zones, I try to space out my actions um, as well. So it's, you know, it's essentially a full-time job for me. Uh, but I always tell people, don't be scared by that. I say, you know, you look at your time and you determine how it's best used and, you know, you plan accordingly. So it can take as little or as much as you'd like. Okay, great. Now, Edwin, how about you? Okay, I, I have uh, two answers for that. The, the answer, the first part of the answer is what I'm doing now. And, and, and the first part of the answer is Sunday. That's the first part of the an answer, Sunday. Sunday afternoon. My, my Sundays are like this. Church, family lunch, blogging. Or blogging, family lunch, church the same thing right so but but now I'm I'm switching in my own company from from my role as a trainer and and finding on making this new role as a writer uh, so, so it's Sunday afternoon usually up to this point but it's going to be probably a few hours a day from now on okay Great. So you make it part of your routine. Now, Dan, how about you? Do you do the same thing, or how do you handle the, the time? Uh, it's a lot more random because I, I work it in with, with other activities in my life. Uh, with respect to the Influential Voices blog, I uh, go by what's on the view from the queue, and if, if there's a response that is expected, I try to have that early on, so then that's out of the way, and then I try to pace any other posts you know, about one or two weeks between, so I don't create too much clutter. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the editors of a different, um, for a different organization I belong to, I'm an editor of that publication, and in the same way I try to, um, you know, I get a prompt, okay, we need more articles this month, and so it, it's, I guess, what I call as the demand drives it, so demand-driven. Uh, in terms of time, it really depends it can be as short or as long as it takes to get that article. So. Okay, great. And by the way, view from the queue is the ASQ blog at asq.org slash blog. And now, Babette, how much time do you spend on blogging? Um, for the person who answered this question, and probably a lot of you, there, I have an editorial calendar. You have a business plan, I have an editorial calendar, I have a writing plan because it keeps you from going crazy. And then also you have to remember that you're not writing a major novel. You know, you're not going to be Ernest Hemingway. It's a 400 to 600 word post. But that being said, when you start out, you're going to agonize about it. And, you know, your first post is probably going to take you several days. You know, it's got to be perfect. But after a while, you realize that sometimes spontaneity, you find your voice, and sometimes spontaneity, I can just be walking down the street, see something, and boom, there's a four to 600 word post and I write it. 
Um, all in all, what I found was best for me uh, is that on uh, usually Monday mornings or Friday afternoons, that's my writing day. And I'm on the road this week, for example, so I preloaded my blog post. Shh, that's my secret. And so uh, on Deliver It, and they're going to be going out like clockwork Monday, uh, and they're on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. So there are a lot of tools that can help you because sometimes you'll have very creative periods. You'll be inspired by things. And other times you'll have droughts. And so I find that when the juices are flowing, I take advantage of them and I'll create some multiple posts. But again, nothing has to be perfect, but it does have to be consistent. There's a high rate of blog abandonment. So if you're going to start to blog and people find your stuff and they really like you, they're going to expect more. So you have to kind of have a game plan as far as how frequently you're going to write. It's better to start out infrequently, maybe once or twice a week, and then add more. But once a month, you're not going to find the audience that you want. I hope this answered your question. All right. Great. Uh, Julie, before, before we move off that, I just want to touch on something that Babette mentioned um, in terms of writing the novel. Uh, <laughs> I, I had opportunity to collaborate with Julia uh, a few weeks ago, and my first draft was over 3,000 words, and through her <laughs> editing expertise, she got it to about 500 words. So, But you know, you probably had six different blog posts there. You, you know, it's really interesting, so go back to that, Dan. You know, I found sometimes I just kind of do this whole blam stuff, but people can only read like four to six hundred pieces, so I, I end up kind of subdividing it and realize I've accomplished a lot more than I thought I, I was. So, Dan, I, I experienced that problem as well. My biggest challenge actually is keeping it short and simple, and I always remind myself of that Mark Twain quote, quote you know, if I had more time, I'd written a shorter letter. <laughs> so I'll write you know, a really long post, and it takes me more time to make it short to, to make yeah. sure I don't lose attention, you know, than not. So that that's a big <laughs> challenge too. But and I wanted to mention that that editorial calendar, uh, that strategy has really saved my a lot of time for me. I've been doing that now for some time. Just being able to organize, um, you know, takes takes a lot out of it and really expedites the whole process. Yeah, and I think we also mentioned we have other demands. I mean, I write for IBM, I write for Rain Today, I write for Top Sales World, so I really have to kind of keep all these moving deadlines. Oh, and by the way, I have a business, so it really helps me organize the chaos, and, and uh, eventually when you can see yourself in a spreadsheet, I think it kind of calms you down a lot, so I agree with you. All right, great. Thanks for your comments, everyone. Um, very good feedback. So I want to address my next question uh, specifically to Dan and Jennifer um, and others if you have feedback as well. But one of the questions we get here at ASQ often is, how can I use social media for my section or division? What's a good strategy for us? Uh, what's a good platform if we're promoting our section or division or communication um, within the section or a member unit uh, for members. So um, I want to uh, put this out to the whole panel, but maybe address Jennifer and Dan first as you've been uh, most involved in this. Uh, so what uh, feedback or suggestions would you have? Um, well, I'll start out. Really, I, I came on, I became more involved with ASQ locally as education chair maybe over a year ago. And at that time, really our only social media activity was a LinkedIn group. Um, but the, the permissions were very restrictive and it wasn't being populated. And we really weren't promoting it at the local dinners and our newsletters. So, you know, at the end of the day, people didn't even really know it was there. Um, the issue that, that came about was, you know, I developed several education opportunities, and they had deadlines, um, also with the monthly dinner deadlines. So we really had, I, I realized we really had important information uh, that a bit large amounts of time was going by before we were able to communicate those, uh, because we do try to minimize the number of emails that go out to members. Um, so really what, I, what I've done so far is I took the LinkedIn group, and um, I, I, I took the took the restrictions out, so it's a completely open group now. Anyone can participate. I promoted it to other local associations such as Apex, you know, which we collaborate with often, um, and then our members as well. And really, we use LinkedIn. More so, our engage, our active engagement is low, but we have almost 400 members in the group now. So they're reading it, and the feedback we're getting is that they appreciate um, 
you know, upcoming events, various uh, announcements for, for that platform. Also, I wanted to extend it out, so I recently created a Facebook page for the local section, the Tampa Bay section. Uh, and what I wanted to do there was kind of keep our members in touch with local government. Uh, quality that's going on is related to there. Um, also be able to kind of cross promote those education opportunities, give people a heads up that, you know, deadlines were approaching. I like to post pictures from our monthly meetings. Um, just I feel like that gets people, you know, better, ex more, more so excited, you know, to come to the next meeting. Oh, it looked like that was a great speaker. You know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the meeting next month. And with over, you know, I think 900,000 members Facebook has now or counting, uh, I figured if people were already there and connecting in that platform personally, this is a really good opportunity for our local ASQ section to get in there and, and, and get them involved in a convenient way because they're already using it. So, uh, and now we are promoting Facebook and the LinkedIn group. Um, in our newsletters, uh, at every monthly meeting, um, and we're trying to get more people involved in that. And, we, and we've, we've, we've received very positive feedback so far. Okay, great. Great ideas. And um, Dan, how about you? Um, speaking for ASQ Vancouver, there, there's um, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Google Plus uh, where they're managed sites, and that's very helpful. From my own perspective, I think that social media is a complement but not a substitute. So the fundamental person-to-person -person engagement has to be in place, and it can be greatly supported and enhanced by uh, social media follow-through. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, it's very good for promoting and cross-promoting. It's also very effective for the follow-up and um, getting that, that um, real-time feedback uh, because... We have a, a series of events. It's not just um, a singular event for the year. The idea is that we want people to return and continue to, um, whether they attend the meetings or take part in the courses or write the exams, you want to build up that uh, continuous involvement, and I think social media is very effective for that. Um, I, I like the idea of the pictures and images, and and it, it really gives a flavor of what these events are like. So I. I think in that sense, social media provides flexibility by incorporating multiple ways to communicate and extending to other uh, resources. It's, it's quite versatile. Okay, excellent. So I want to pose my next question to Babette and Edwin, and we're getting some questions from viewers about using social media for business. So Edwin and Babette, you own your own businesses, you do consulting sure. work. How do you use social media for that specific purpose? And specifically, um, I'm getting, uh, looking at a question from a viewer um, saying that um, clients don't want to be sold to on social media, but the tide may be starting to turn. So how do you use social media? media and uh, find that balance between sharing good information and selling to potential clients. Yeah, and, and that's an excellent question because there's a lot of buzz going on, on on social media now called social selling and somehow you're supposed to be engaging your customers. But a lot, all of us have read tweets or come-ons, quite honestly, on Facebook or LinkedIn that says, you know, it sounds like a sales spiel, it sounds like a sales pitch. Okay, and and that is selling, and nobody wants to be sold to or sold at. They're buyers. They'll buy whether they'll buy whether whatever you're selling, you know, intrigues them or not. You want to start a conversation, and so in fact, I just did a blog post for IBM on so it's it's the social business, and all it is is that you know before the internet and right after the advent of the wheel. It's social. What we're doing right now is we're having a conversation about business issues. And that's what blogging is. Blogging is part of a content marketing strategy and it gives people the experience of what it's like to work with me. What are some of the issues that I'm going to be addressing with their business? And, and it's really all about their business. It's about the customer. It's not about how great thou art, you know. It's, ju it's just that you're developing your customer focus. And what you're doing is you're initiating... Julie, while she's coming back on, can I expand on that as well? Oh, she back. Uh, well, uh, um, I, I guess back. I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> 
I have about, um, sorry, I think you cut out for um, just a minute, but um, we will uh, go to Edwin now and give him a chance to answer the question. Um, Edwin, all right. Um, could you talk about how you use um, social media as part of your, your business strategy? Okay, yes. Uh, the, the answer is Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me explain that. Let me explain that. There was a time about four or five years ago when Jennifer Lopez was everywhere. She was in movies. Uh, she was having a new line of clothing. clothing. She was having a perfume. And, and I was fed up. I didn't want to see any more of Jennifer Lopez. Okay? So, so don't become Jennifer Lopez. Don't become a diva in, 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 in uh, the social media. When I'm selling, I'm selling. For example, if there's a new Greenbelt class, then I go to LinkedIn and Facebook, Facebook and I say, there's a new green belt class, there's a new black belt class. But most of the time, as Babette says, I prefer to start a conversation. I prefer to share with people. And, and I don't, or I, at least I try not to cross both. If I'm selling, I'm selling. New green belt class in two weeks. Most of the time, I want to have this conversation. And I love that, Babette. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. And those conversations that you start with customers are so rewarding. A lot of times they're sources of my inspiration for blog posts because you begin, if you listen instead of talk, you start to hear common trends that people are saying and even in different business verticals and you realize that they're what I call common denominators and so in a sense they've chosen us to be their voice and it's really it, I've had some amazing conversations and really gotten a lot of inside information uh, and insight I always go for the aha moment so uh, Mm -hmm. Blogging, you know, in that respect, I mean, yes, I'm, yes, I'm an expert in my field, but these people are an expert in their fields too, and it's about sometimes they're there, they're ready to ask for help, and sometimes the conversation you start gives them the confidence to ask for your help. And and in 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 from a business perspective, at the end, those conversations will lead. To business transactions. Yeah. Yeah. From an internal perspective, I think I've observed just from consulting and consulting with other companies and as well as ProQC, it's very difficult because I, I believe that as well. I, I do not believe active selling has a role uh, in social media. It should be about adding value and that content and establishing those relationships. Uh, but I found it's been a personal challenge. Um, to get traditional sales individuals who suggest, you know, well, why don't you, you know, go ahead and post on your blog that we have, you know, a promotional rate on such and such. And I said, you know, it's hard to explain, but the, the blog is a place where we want to answer client questions and add valuable content versus, you know, actively selling. So that's something when I, when I speak with small business owners on a consulting basis, or when I'm talking to our salespeople with ProQC, I am constantly having to reiterate that you know we do not want to push sales in, in, you know in these platforms. We really just want to be there and establish ourselves as experts and you know answer questions that they may have. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, uh, great feedback, everyone. So um, the next question, um, I want to talk a little bit about your inspirations uh, when, when you blog or use social media. Um, which blogs do you personally enjoy reading? Are there blogs that you read that you feel inspired by? Or maybe it's not even a blog, maybe it's a column somewhere online. Um, but let's talk about which blogs do you personally enjoy reading. So um, Dan, let's start with you. Um, I've really found that um, the group of influential voices it's, it's a very diverse portfolio and I get something different from each of them so uh, and even as as my own blog matures I can pull something for example uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier one of the influential voices is out of Hong Kong uh, Dr. Lotto Lei he um, always has images of, of the various events he attends and at first I was unsure what the you know why this is good but I find I'm gravitating to that because you know, it gives me a flavor of what's happening there, and and it, it stimulates an interest. Uh, in addition, there are some people that I used to work with in the Vancouver region who've 
Um, in one case, uh, a lady that um, I taught with, um, she's now pursuing her master uh, Six Sigma black belt, and she's kind of journaling her steps toward that. Another case, um, this, I have an earlier example or earlier career in software testing and test management, and so uh, those people that I work with that are now blogging their activities are, um, you know, it's it's interesting. And I recently found a colleague who's got a blog about he terms it music and life and it's actually quite inspirational he it's not work related it's more about family and the things that he does to uh, pursue his uh, spiritual enlightenment and inner peace and I, I think that um, you know it, you can always pull something from that and, and to those who are on the influential voices I uh, thank you very much and I hope that it continues to evolve and and bring something different to the collective um, proper intellectual property. All right, great. Thanks, Dan. I um, just want to mention that in, you can find a link to all the Influential Voices blog on the um, event page for this Hangout. And let's go to um, Edwin. Um, do you want to share any blogging uh, inspirations, any blogs that you uh, enjoy reading? Uh, th this is funny. I usually, well, yesterday, for the first time yesterday, I read all the Influential Voices blogs, all, all of them all of them, each one of them. Before that, uh, I would probably read most of them, but not all. But yesterday, I went on and read all of them. Okay, Most of the time, I go and read uh, from the Influential Voices, I read uh, uh, Manu, Ma Manu, Manu uh, Bora, because I know him. He's, on, he's a, a, a good friend. He's an authority. And uh, his writing style is so engineering. It's so to the point. Okay, he he always answers the questions that uh, uh, the view from the queue asks always. So I always go and read his uh, uh, blog first. Then I randomly select two or three more. And get ideas for my own blog, and and again, this is when when I answered uh, <clears throat> the influential voices blog, and when I write in English. But I, uh, I I made a commitment to myself that I will read all of them from now on, at least once a week. All right, great. And uh, Lavette, how about you? Which blogs do you enjoy reading? Well. Wow. Um... My uh, Hootsuite feed <laughs> is full of probably thousands of blogs a day, including news feeds. Some of the the neatest ones that I like is, I, I love the influential blo uh, voices because to me it's like a newsletter blog. So it just gives me the skinny um, across uh, geographically diverse, uh, globally diverse um, uh, kind of patchwork quilt of what quality is going on. And and by the way, for anybody who's listening today, if you have something that you would like me to blog about, send me an email through my blog, and um, I'll be happy to see if we can kind of work it in that, that editorial calendar. I'm kind of interested in seeing what's on your mind. Uh, Dan Waldschmidt's Edgy Conversations is really fantastic about kind of overcoming the stuff that's holding you back. Jill Conrath has a lot of no-nonsense in terms of how to uh, get through uh, to uh, get, get past gatekeepers. Uh, I like Wise Analytics. It uh, deals with a lot of financial aspects. Uh, the uh, IBM Midsize Insider is really eclectic again, but it deals with cybersecurity as well as business issues. And then uh, Top Sales World, too. Uh, as far as my sources of in inspiration, you know, I can be sitting having coffee in a restaurant and just overhear something or see something or see a scenario and it's just this aha and it's like my brain opens up and I just start to combine a lot of stuff that's been floating around there and it just gives, gives me a voice to find how to how to say it and so that's what I like about reading all this stuff it's it's about thinking about input throughput and output and it's really I focus on the throughput, you know, a more horizontal flow, cross-functional collaboration. So, um, yeah, that's that's what keeps me jazzed every day about uh, blogging. Okay, great. And um, Jennifer, do you want to share any blogs that you enjoy reading? 
Um, well, yeah, and but first I want to recommend uh, how I, the sanity comes about because there are so many influential voices and they're all great. And of course, I love you from the queue. Um, and there are many other industry-related blogs, especially I love Seth Godin. He's kind of a marketing guru. I enjoy uh, reading his blog, but uh, organizing it really. And one of my biggest recommendations there is to get a newsfeed aggregator. Um, you know, of course, it used to be Google Reader, and it took me forever to find a replacement for that. Um, but using some Something like Feedly, you know, allows me to enter in all the blogs I'm interested in, and it's a centralized place where I can flip through and read what I want and skip over what I don't. Uh, but instead of having to go to so many different places, it, it gives me the option and expedites the time involved. So um, that would be my recommendation there. And definitely, oh, and then at the recent World Conference, I met um, the individual who does Lean Blitz. And I'd have to mention him because ever since the conference and I've been reading that one, uh, he's got some pretty great content there as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So my next question is for Edwin specifically. And Edwin, you're kind of um, somewhat in a unique place because you blog in English and in Spanish. And as you said, you have a wide um, uh, audience who uh, reads your blog because you uh, blog in Spanish. So could you talk a little bit about that? Um, the majority of blogs that we see and even the influential voices are written in English, uh, but you write for a somewhat different audience and you sometimes translate posts or you do two versions of them. So can you um, talk about your experience of writing in a language other than English? Yes, sure. Uh, first, I have to go back to 1987 when I became uh, a trainer, a college professor for the first time. I was 22 years old. My students were older than me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first time I, I, I taught a class, I had this idea that I would become a combination of the best qualities of my own professors. Okay? With years, I, I discovered that that was not the case and that I had to uh, develop my own trainer. And this is important because I know my trainer, Edwin the trainer, is very different than Edwin the regular day-to-day -day person. Okay, so I, I know my trainer. I, I know that guy. It's very different from me. It's kind of, it's a little crazy. That, that person is a little crazy. Okay, now, when I write, I have to find my writer. And uh, I've been finding that I don't have one writer. I have two. I have the Spanish writer and I have the English writer. Okay, when I write in Spanish, I tend to still be the trainer. I'm still training. Okay, and uh, I I relate to different uh, people in different countries in in Spanish in our culture. I'm I'm having, as Babette said, I'm having this conversation, and I'm I know when I am writing for somebody in El Salvador. I know when I'm writing for somebody in Ecuador. I know when I'm writing something that makes sense in Mexico. Okay, uh, to give you an example, I explain uh, hypothesis testing and p-value using the Estadio Azteca in Mexico, which is the, uh, the largest stadium in, in Mexico. And usually when Mexico plays in Mexico, they win. So I explain to, to my audience that the null hypothesis in hypothesis testing is just like Mexico playing in Estadio Azteca, and everybody gets it. Okay? If I do the same thing in English, nobody's going to get it. Okay? But I found that my English writer is an outsider. It's somebody from, from, from a different place, it's somebody uh, who wants to help the American audience get something about the rest of us. Hmm. Okay, it, the, my, my outsider writer, the one who writes in English, wants the American Society for Quality to make the transition from American Society for Quality to ASQ Global. And I've been very critical about this. Uh, ASQ doesn't have the slightest idea 
of how to become global. Okay, and the only way for ASQ to become global is if we, the outsiders, help ASQ get there. Okay, so so in Spanish I'm still a trainer. In English, I am an outsider. Basically. You're an evangelist. So, okay, something like that. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. And Edwin, thanks for your feedback. And we are at ASQ, we are listening and gathering this uh, feedback. So uh, thanks for sharing it. Um, we do uh, certainly consider it um, and uh, uh, make our plans and strategy based on feedback that we get. So um, I want to ask another question about new and emerging social media platforms or even blogging platforms. So I'm seeing a question from Cesar Guevara, who's of course one of the influential voices bloggers, about Google Plus, um, who's using it. So of course we are currently all um, using Google Plus for this Hangout. Um, but I'm curious if anyone else is using um, Google Plus on a regular basis, um, and if so, why? And uh, maybe if you're, if you're not using Google Plus, which other social media platforms which are uh, maybe newer are you using or considering using? And I'll open this to whoever would like to answer the question. Um. A lot of us are using Google Plus uh, to publish our articles. Uh, it's it's again it's getting more eyeballs on it, getting more readers on it. Um, so w whenever whenever I publish a blog, again I've got kind of a you know a group of people. Uh, we will G plus it, and and it really helps a lot with. Uh, search engine optimization, but more importantly, it's establishing your authentic Google authorship uh, and your footprint, your, your internet footprint, because the Digital Millennium Act, in terms of controlling intellectual property that we create, uh, it, 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 there's a lot of scraping of content, and it goes on other people's sites, so the best way to really authenticate that you are you uh, is to G plus everything as well and um, you'll pull a lot of other uh, interested parties uh, from outside of LinkedIn, from outside of Hootsuite, from outside of Twitter. It, it's, it's really interesting. You're, you're never reaching the entire galaxy uh, on one social platform. Um, also, uh, in fact, uh, as Julie and I were talking about last week, uh, Google's improved their technology of these Hangouts because they used to really, they used to, it used to break up in a lot of pixels and it used to have poor sound quality. So, um, and even with the split screen uh, that we can see everybody speaking. So I think as the integrity of uh, G Plus improves. Uh, we'll be using it a lot more for webinars and seminars. Um, otherwise, I'll use something like Bright Talk or a lot of other platforms uh, for live chats. Uh, there's Twitter chats as well. Uh, and I also use Nimble, which is a, so a social media platform. It, it helps you uh, track uh, uh, social the social aspects of, of your business. So that's an intriguing platform as well. But uh, yeah. Uh, G Plus is has been uh, very very uh, helpful, and thank God it's reliable now. They must have somebody in quality involved there, I think. <laughs> so. Let's hope so. Um, anyone else want to um, add your uh, feedback? Uh, well, I'll respond because I think that the the SEO really started as the primary thing for us. Um, just being Google, when you post it, you're more likely to get the exposure there, so the keywords and such were important. So really, we originally started using it for cross-promotion purposes. However, I've kind of expanded that, and, and we used to use uh, Skype for a lot of our monthly um, you know, marketing and operations calls uh, to connect different countries. And I, w I have suggested, and I'm hoping we move forward, to kind of using the Google Hangouts uh, to where we have better video capability. I think that it offers a lot more than Skype, and I think there's a good opportunity there, um, you know, as well as Hangouts with our clients. LinkedIn is the number one for both personal and professional. I see increasing in engagement, but Google Plus is certainly number two, and I had my doubts at first, but it really is proving. I mean, Babette mentioned all the updates and everything. I agree with that. Um, Google Plus really is gaining in popularity, and I have, and I find that both for ProQC and myself, I have very different audiences than in my other platforms. Uh, the people who I'm connecting with on Google Plus, I'm not necessarily connecting with anywhere else on Twitter or LinkedIn. So really, I feel like I've reached a whole different audience 
um, and I have capabilities internally that will work out really well as, as well. Okay, great. Um, Dan or Edwin, did you want to uh, contribute? Or um, if not, we'll move on to the next question. Okay. I'd say I have nothing to add. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, then let's move on to the next question. And um, just for viewers who are maybe joining us, um, we have about 10 minutes left in the chat. We'll be uh, chatting until uh, 1 p.m. Central Time. And um, yes, this Hangout will be recorded and shared. So I had a question about that, so answering that question. So yes, you will get to see it. And um, since we just have a bit of time left, I want to um, pose this question to everyone. But the number one question we get about social media at ASQ is from people who are curious about social media, want to get started, not really sure how. Um, they may be on LinkedIn, which is our uh, by far the most popular platform for um, the ASQ and probably the quality community. But they're not sure how they should get started. They ask if they should be on every social network that's out there or if they should just focus in on one. So what would be your advice to people asking those questions? And uh, let's start with Edwin. Uh, the, the number of, of social media platforms will depend on, on how responsible you can be taking care of them. Okay, as I said, I just hire a, pe a person to take care of that, right? So that means that we will increase our presence in social media just because I'm going to have a person taking care of it. Okay, so for now it's Facebook, mainly LinkedIn, and a little Twitter. There will definitely be more of that, and definitely I'll go to Google Hangout, to Google Plus. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to use more. I will if it makes sense. Okay. Great. Um, how about uh, Dan? Thank you. Uh, I think that it's very important to understand your comfort level with what you want to express and how you want to be seen. Uh, benchmarking is a quality practice, which I think would be very uh, valid. So in order to understand what sort of presence you want, look at, investigate, and identify which are good examples that you want to emulate and uh, match up with those. I think the safest ones, um, LinkedIn, just what I've observed is that people just have what I call a tombstone presence. They have their name and their date and start from that point. And um, I say this somewhat cautiously because you can't, it's very difficult to undo something if you've made, say, a, a negative or controversial. So uh, approach this with responsibility and maturity. And... Um, also for security, and I, I say this, I had a Twitter account compromised. Uh, one one thing that happens is when they do, people get a hold of your email, they uh, impersonate someone that you know. And in my case, it was, um, hey, I got some pictures from last weekend. Take a look. And I pressed the link, and next thing I know, my my account just sending all these um, inappropriate posts. So um, be very careful with um, what it may lead. So it's it's really. Uh, Emulate good examples, take caution, and take responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, social media is overwhelming. I mean, there's just a lot of noise out there and confusion. So uh, the one thing not to do is throw social media sp spaghetti against the wall and hope that it sticks, you know, and just start kind of twittering and tweeting and blamming and, and just exploding. And then all of a sudden, you're exhausted and you stop. Pick one thing that you're really comfortable at. For example, there are some LinkedIn groups. Comment, comment on even the you know the ASQ group. Get used to having a social conversation and see if it's for you. There are a lot of voyeurs out there. You hover, but you never engage in what we're writing about or you know in in any of the professional groups. And and there's over I think 600,000 groups. So there's tons of groups, even if it's a hobby group for you. Get used to having a social conversation, and then figure out what you know that may be satisfying to you and you can learn a lot that way too and then pick one so if you want to blog LinkedIn has a blogging platform now and if you want to blog once a week then get your first four posts ideas for your first four posts and use that and see what the response is there and get your feet wet there and stick with it 
it could be that that develops into your very own, let's say, WordPress or TypePad blog, you know, that you have an independent blog. Um, once you've mastered that, and it takes some time, make sure you can be at it consistently with high quality content. Uh, and, and again, and that you're inspired and your content gets better with time. Then switch over into the next media. For me, that's Twitter. Uh, I found a lot of, especially dealing with the manufacturing and startup community in particular, uh, and younger communities as well, um, they were on Twitter. They're very responsive. And so, uh, but I'm not just tweeting all about me. People will come to my Twitter feed. It's sort of like a, a stock ticker tape, you know, that's, you know, like at the news report. It's when people read my Twitter feed, I'm also tweeting relevant content in four or five targeted areas. So it's almost like a newsletter. They know at any time during the day. So that's part of my content marketing strategy. Have a strategy for participating in Twitter. And, and we've all seen this, know that if you're having some sort of very casual conversation on Twitter, the entire universe, as Dan said, can see that and it doesn't go away. And that's not really the type of conversation you post on LinkedIn. And so there are some, some very different types of boundaries and social rules for the various platforms. And I always say, uh, well, Tony Dungy has a real interesting quote that he has for all the the first year rookies for uh, the NFL before you tweet delete and so <laughs> you know think before you tweet um, so yeah just pick your platform but also have a plan behind it and so that you're not just all over the place okay great and finally Jennifer um, if you could share uh, a piece of advice for people interested in uh, social media what would you say um, well, I'll make it quick because I see that we're short on time, uh, but I recently developed a webinar to address this exact question, and I centered it around quality. Folks will love this, the Plan, Do, Check, Act. Um, so, But just to highlight it, really planning, as I mentioned before, determining how much time you have. I think Babette even mentioned, uh, you know, inactivity actually is reflecting worse. Uh, more negatively, you know, if you get started and you kind of wane in your activity. Also, I recommend in terms of planning just to kind of, you know, go check out different groups. Each one has a culture. So, for example, if you're going to go into LinkedIn, uh, you know, and update your profile and, and, and get going with that, don't just jump in and start out, you know, asking a question in a group. Get kind of that, that cult, the culture of the group feel um, so where you can kind of fit in comfortably when you are ready. Um, to post. Also, in terms of, I believe you had asked a question too, in terms of, of resources and, you know, how do you learn more? And one of my very favorite sites, of course, is Mashable, and they have several quick start beginner's guide. They've got the beginner's guide to Twitter, the beginner's guide to Facebook, there's the WordPress. Um, it's very, very intuitive in terms of getting started, but I think even before then, people should really give some significant thought um, to planning. What are their objectives? Is it for personal? personal branding. Um, I get a lot of students that say, I have no on-the-job experience and I'm, I graduated and I need a job. Okay, well then you can get some experiencing est experience establishing yourself as an expert by creating a blog. Maybe that's something you know that you should do. And you know, LinkedIn to develop your network, etc. So you know, determine what the objective is, develop action items, and really follow all this great quality stuff that we talk about and apply it to social media. All right. Great, um, great suggestions, everyone. So we're just about out of time. So thank you to all the participants for taking the time to talk with us and share your perspectives and feedback. Um, Julia, bef yes. before we close off, I just like, if I may, one final comment about blogging. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one one thing that um, it offers is versatility, and and the example is I had a blog that you referenced. Um, I inserted a comment about a Scandinavian quality model as a rhetorical question, and that's actually the part that um, you referenced. So because of that, I went back after it was posted. I, I looked up uh, some research on what they do in Scandinavia, and particularly Sweden, which, was the which were the examples um, cited in um, the view from the queue. And I was able to follow that up with, with a short summary. So I think that Unlike in print media, once it's published, it's locked down until the next um, edition. In a blog, you have that fluidity to 
uh, make continuous updates, whether it's to correct the typo or to augment some content. And I think that that's, that dynamic nature is what makes it a very appealing and um, applicable mode. Yep. Um, yeah, I agree completely, um, and that's uh, great to close on the on the comment. So once again, thank you for every um, to everyone for joining us. We did get a few questions that we did not get to, and some of them are very specific. And I will route them to those specific uh, bloggers and participants who may uh, best answer them. Uh, the hangout will be recorded and shared. And I apologize again for any technical glitches that we experienced. So um, if you are just joining us, you can see the entire conversation on um, ASQ's YouTube channel on our Google. Plus page, and the video will also be shared on Facebook, Twitter, and our LinkedIn. So once again, thank you for joining us, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.